So my name is Matt Honore. I am part of the uh, evaluation team. I also want to introduce, uh, if you've, you've seen Adrian before, but Anne uh, is also here, our third member. She's here today. We are now full. It is Voltron. We are good to go. Um, so before I get into what this is, great. I have a few caveats. If it's not exceedingly clear to you right now, I'm a big nerd. Um, I love Star Wars. I, uh, I look at data visualization blogs. And uh, I was actually made fun of other scientists yesterday for showing them a visualization of Twitter and Game of Thrones and how many times people's names were mentioned. So I get made fun of by other nerds. Um, I have a few radical ideas about PowerPoints. The biggest one being I don't like words on PowerPoints. I have pictures. Uh, if I have more than 10 words on a slide, I failed. So if you were really bored with this presentation, uh, count how many times I have more than 10 words and come back to me at the end. Um, I hope that my passion translates to you. I love uh, evaluation. I also love slide presentation. So this dovetail is really well for me. Um, and uh, lastly, if, again, I'm a weird guy, I get weirder when they give me, my, they give me a microphone, <laughs> and I get way weirder when I know I'm being recorded. So <laughs> let's see when this whole thing falls off the tracks. <laughs> so I have a couple names for today. We have Prove and Improve as our eval. We also have a riff on if somebody, a tree falls in the forest, does anybody hear it? And then, lastly, as an attempt to have you pay attention today, for those of us who can't see in the back, this is my desperate attempt to captivate your attention with a slide presentation on a Friday afternoon after lunch. <laughs> so the task at hand, now that I've gotten that out of the way, uh, I have four, four main points I really want to get to today. Um, we want to review kind of the need of evaluation and why we're here with Exodo. We want to touch on the actual evaluation of Exodo and uh, how it touches on the larger build program. We want to show you a bit of a, what we've learned so far, a mild sprinkling of samples. And then we want to go into a mini dive of what, what the process is and have you kind of experience a little bit as well to get a taste of uh, my life. So first, we're covering need and purpose. Why, um, why is evaluation important? Or better yet, is evaluation important? We should work for there. Um, it is. Uh, <laughs> but there can be a disconnect for it, or there can be a need to plug into evaluation. Uh, one of the needs that, one of the ways that my passion has happened, I've been part of program staff for a couple different social service agencies, and we find ourselves spinning our wheels more often than not, doing the same thing over and over again, feeling pressured that we don't have time to change things or have money to change things. And there's a step missing right there where evaluation is you're able to reflect, go back, see what has happened, and improve upon it. Um, Carlos had hinted at this at the uh, first time about that need of, of evaluation, and I think the easiest ways to explain it is to prove and improve. We want to prove that things are working, and in the context of Exodo, we want to prove that our interventions in Exodo are working. But we also want to fix what needs to get better. We need to improve what we're also doing as well. So there's a bit of proof and uh, introspection as well. And then what was even covered today is context. If housing is location, 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 evaluation is context, context, context. Um, programs and projects occur in a context. Your, it, your sites are in context. And then our data collection, dissemination, and analysis is also in a certain kind of context that we need to be aware of. Purpose. Why are we here? Um, the goal is to diversify the, the uh, biomedical workforce. That's the very short answer to a very long question, uh, and a long answer at that, too. So we want to know what kind of things work and what kind of things aren't working. And we find that out by collecting data. And there's two different types that we collect. There's the things like grades, attendance, 
classes, graduation, a lot of things that I don't necessarily have to go straight to you and ask you what's going on. I can talk to your institution, I can talk to your faculty as well. But these things don't tell me the barriers that you're facing. These things don't tell me what's working, what's not working, how well it's working in many cases. And that's where we have to talk, or we like to, have to. I'm in my data cave a lot. I need to get out and talk to people more often. Uh, but it's, it's trying to find out from you, directly from you, what's going on. One of those was the orientation survey on Tuesday. Um, so we need your help to ask those questions. And as Tom just mentioned too, a lot of these questions are NIH mandated. Uh, when we go through those hallmarks, um, evaluation itself is a research project. We had you sign those consent forms. Uh, we had people talking today about the need of consent forms too, but this is like a research project within a research project. It's kind of a Russian doll kind of thing. Uh, so you're involved as you'll be going through and doing these. We're also, this is a project as well. So have a couple questions. These are kind of examples of things that we ask. How many scholars? end up going to graduate school. That's a pretty simple one to answer, I hope. Are scholars identifying as researchers? Uh, and how can Exodo support the diverse needs of cohorts? I failed on this slide. Um, so those are three questions, but we have like 300. So there's a lot of things that we end up asking, a lot of questions. Going back to my nice, calm, clean waters. Talk about... Um, what we do and how it connects to the larger build grant. So we have, this is my representation kind of on the fly. I realized it was confusing at first, the white is water. Um, but people are looking, is that Alaska? And then you have to like zoom out, it's like a magic eye thing. So thank you to Adrian for pointing it out to me, otherwise this could have gone bad for about like 15%, 25%. Um, so we have 11 autonomous sites, we have 11 sovereign sites that 11 different ways of collecting data, 11 different ways of doing things, and to mention that 11 completely right ways of doing things, they're just different. So we're trying to gather that all under one kind of model and one consistent path. Not to mention the geographic representation here, when we have the number of time zones. I believe in Guam it's tomorrow. So, <laughs> when I talk about Matt sends out a quick email on Friday, he's like, oh, not going to get a response until Sunday, which he isn't there. So, there's a lot of coordination syncing that we need to do to make this work. Um, so, without data, this is just a theory. This is just an anecdote. Uh, this is someone's opinion of, of what things work. So, we need to prove that this is working. I, I myself need proof. I don't know if you know of the Earth is flat theory, uh, but it is making a comeback. Go into YouTube, well, don't bother. Uh, but, <laughs> but these are things that people say that you need to prove when you say these things. Uh, was it uh, Pluto is a planet? Pluto isn't a planet? I forget now. I think it's back to planet. Um, no, I hear, forget Pluto. Uh, <laughs> And then coffee is good for you again. Uh, these are things that we need proof to back up our claims. Um, so we, we back up these claims with this data. The government in particular, government in particular really loves to track data. Um, and with good right, it is taxpayer money, they're beholden to the taxpayers, so we need to make sure that we're good stewards of this money. By doing so is data. So kind of going over that again pragmatically, um, you don't weigh in, you don't wrestle. Uh, that's an idiom that I love to say, but I have to explain it because even I don't know boxing. But if you want to really box and you're doing it professionally, you have to weigh in. Otherwise, you can't punch the other guy in the face. So <laughs> that kind of gets off the track there. But the idea is that we need the data in order to get the money. Um, the other goals are the, the same things as our original point of being here. These are, are asking questions, receiving answers about barriers, about diversifying the biomedical workforce. So we collect information a variety of ways, a lot of different angles. We talk about surveys, grades, more surveys, focus groups, interviews. These are all different angles looking at the same thing, but we're trying to get a fuller picture of it. So with that, we collect a lot of data. I don't want you to actually focus on, again, magic eye thing. Just look at this from the very beyond. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, 
using this as a visual representation. I could have used a rubber ducky up here to make the same point. Um, this is one block of information. This is everything we collect from students, from faculty, from institutions in a given year. So this is, this is a big block of information. Um, now we time it by three for your, ostensibly your time frame here, three years, right? We're doing everything three times for you, for you, with you. Um, differences are each year we have RLCs that you go into, there are different orientations or different summer experiences, but for all intents and purposes, we are doing this three times. And if you know where I'm going with this later, then we do it for every cohort. So we've had one year already. One year is not a lot of data compared to 12 years of this going on too right now. So we're at the very beginning stages of collecting this, but this is the plan. Um, this isn't here to confuse or impress or overwhelm. It's merely to show you we got it covered. A lot of different angles, a lot of different viewpoints that we are trying to look at to make sure that we're doing this the right way. And it's part of that larger change agent. We talked about build, like this is, this is one sight of that. If we go back to my, my brilliant picture here of, of Exodo, and then we have actual the build sites. Pretty impressive PowerPoint presentation, Matt. So we have 92 different distinct locations. If we're talking about R11, that's one-tenth of all the different locations that are going on. So when we talk about our pie, maybe a pie is not a great example. This is, this is going to stick with the, let's dump the pie idea. But this is the reason we're all here, too. When we talk about those kind of graphs where we have like CEO and we kind of build down, what I like to think of is like scholars. And then we build down from scholars. Everything's feeding from what the scholars are saying. But this is the first time this is happening in a scale this big. So it's a pilot. It's the first time we're doing things. It's discovery. It's dynamic. It's innovative. Um, so we're, again, we're learning what works. We're learning what doesn't work. And we're fixing that. My best example I could find in the time frame that I had was uh, putting a man on the moon. Like, it didn't happen the first time. And some very unofficial Wikipedia research, before we got to the moon, we had 32 missions. And NASA declared 15 of them failures. But you think about it, then they went to the moon again, and again, and again, and again, and again. And they kept on learning these things. Um, so thinking about what's going to result from the work that you all do, I think of it in terms of the space program. Think about the spin-off technologies that came from that. We're talking about solar cells, um, uh, freeze drying, that's not a great one. I think it worse as I wrote them down. Scratch-free list resistant lenses for those of us who wear gla glasses, that is a life changer. And then for me with the one-year-old, uh, infrared ear thermometers. There are two other ways you can get a thermometer from a child. <laughs> I love infrared ear thermometers at the doctor's office. So we're going to samples. This is where we're reflecting back in our pool. Um, the act of improving, uh, proving and improving involves a lot of education. These are quick showing of last year's cohort, kind of there's some quick numbers here, and then this year's some quick numbers as well. The total applicants is literally those that made it to committee. It's not the full application process for it. Um, but we look at these numbers here and we think of what we can do to support, what's showing up for us that says what programs, what projects need to do to support their Exito scholars better. Um, what is the saying to you right now? So, I have some quick survey response rates from last year. Again, this is another failure, if we're counting. Um, but we have some data from the survey I just want to quickly share with you. If we had 72 at the cohort, 67 ended up saying they did the survey. And then we have people who didn't answer the survey enough as well. So this is a quick look into how numbers go down from actually when we take surveys. So out of 65 people, this is one quick one that we're looking at of people going into their sophomore year of some data that we pulled from this. Using context as an example, I'm looking at the bottom one here of using the library. So I looked at that the first time I put it together. I was like, oh, people know the library. Um, put on that, they're also sophomores at their institution, so hopefully they've been to the library before, they know how to use it, so this question is getting less important. We also have two-thirds, um, uh, 
we actually had a library presentation, I believe, earlier that week. So when people were asked about the new library, if they didn't, they had a whole like half hour talking about the library. And then two thirds of those people didn't go to PSU, so that that wasn't working for them either. So maybe a lot of people already knew what the library was, but looking at that at first, I didn't have that context. So that's one example of um, of what we gather from your data. So. I'm going to pivot here a little bit, and we're going to talk about our, uh, a mini dive into evaluation. So in orientation, I hope everybody took their orientation survey. I have counts, I believe 81 as of Tuesday out of 91. So we are looking at questions in these groups. What I want to do is have you kind of take a step back and look at this orientation again from a new lens. You filled it out and you probably looked at this and said, oh, that was an interesting question, or I'd like to know about that. Maybe you didn't, maybe you just answered it in which case, thank you. Um, but I do want to kind of have us look at this from a different angle of us as evaluators, you're all now honorary Exodo evaluators, congratulations. Um, you can also have a meaningless tile of senior research assistant, just like me. Um, but what I want to do is demystify the process for you of what goes on with this. So the plan is we understand what happens with data and we gain your perspective on what we can learn. Um, I'm going to do everyone a big favor by just looking at one, I, one part of analysis and one part of looking at this, which is the plan itself. Um, and if we have time, brain porting, R brain porting, reporting, <laughs> brain porting. I'm going to copyright that. <laughs> so analysis plan, what does that mean? Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to hand out for each table a copy of the survey. I didn't print out 90 surveys. You're welcome. Let's save a tree today. But hopefully we can remember some of them, but we can go back to the survey as we need to. Um, we're going to find out of these maybe two questions you have from this as a table, and we're going to report back on maybe your top two important questions. These things could be as simple as what is the average age of an Exodo scholar? Totally fine. I want to know that too. The other question, you could even expand that by saying, what's the average age of an Exodo scholar compared to PSU, compared to Oregon, compared to United States? Um, these are kind of questions I want us to think about when we look at the questions that I'm going to hand out. So if I could have somebody planning um, help me hand out one of these per table as I continue to talk. That'd be great. We have, oh, now I have a embarrassment of riches. <laughs> so I know we're running behind time here. I want to give as much time as we can to look at this. But again, discuss in your groups as, as tables. Try to think of what you want to know from these questions. Is there anything that came up to you while you were taking this survey of, this was interesting, I'd like to know more about this, or how do other people respond to this? Um, discussing groups, and then your top two questions, and why. I want to, let's just pass around the mic. I want to hear um, if you have two, if you have one, totally fine, um, but let's, Let's start the ball rolling. I'm going to give this table the mic first, and we can pass them around. Um, so our first question is, so if we have less financial help than someone who has more, uh, does, do, the, do the students that have less um, get additional help, or is it just equal throughout the board? Great. Yeah, I will not be answering these questions. These are all... These are all theoretical. So we're referring to question number four. How much of next year's ex educational expenses do you expect to cover from each of the personal sources listed below? And our question was, well, how do we answer that? And do we have to develop a budget plan? Meaning, do we have to like um, look at the website and see this is how much expense it, how much it costs to attend Portland State University, and then 
do we have to take a calculator and calculate, okay, this is what I might get from the 60% from build except, uh, Exedo, um, and I don't know where I was going with that, but <laughs> thank you. You doubled down on the survey. You asked the question about the survey itself. That's some inception kind of stuff going on there. So what we looked at with the survey is the overall lack of psychological evaluation to do with it. A lot of what we talked about this, this week is imposter uh, theory and uh, discriminatory practices and I think it would be very, we thought it would be very valuable to collect data on, on a scale of 10. How often did you feel like you experienced imposter or discrimination in your classes and we believe the hypothesis will be that uh, you will collect a lot of data showing that we need uh, psychological and social support and that could be very um, or, uh, progressive for this program to implement some kind of psychological help for individuals. Thank you. Someone asking for more survey questions. Hi. So we were wondering, how does OHSU affiliate with Build Exito? I mean, we got the tour and all that, and we're like, okay, we share a building, but it's just like, okay, does that mean we get a step up as far as um, a grad school? I mean, do we get like a better chance of going there? Or I mean, what do they do for us? I'm so glad I said before I'm not answering these questions. <laughs> but I think that that's a question that is really important to ask and one that someone else should really answer for you. Um, but <laughs> if there's like a parking lot, honestly, if there's a parking lot that we can put that on to have that answer qu or that question answered would be a good idea. Are we doing two? Are we doing two questions? Okay. Well, we picked two. Um, the first one was about the financial aid in relation to why people are going back to school. So, um, are you going back to school for a better job, better, more money? And then, is that all financial aid wise? And then the second one we did was the um, have you personally experienced the following forms of bias, harassment, discrimination while at this college or university? And we responded to it in a sense of, I feel like we've been talking about barriers and about mentorship and that's helpful and that's supportive, but that's not really addressing how to change the game, how to change the system. So how are we gonna make it so that there aren't those barriers for the next time? So how are you addressing that? Great, thank you. Wait a second, you guys almost got by, didn't you? Haha, <laughs> nice try. <laughs> Uh, one of our questions uh, concerned the, from the packet was about how well the advising was and asking a question like this would give like a good insight about the program, about whether we are receiving the right advising for what we're doing and could, you know, help improve it in the future if it needs to be. Did we have a second question? Um, we were also talking about looking at um, the household income for the student and how much of the advising services um, and other sort of mentoring opportunities they take advantage of and seeing if maybe that's indicative of if there is a limitation on their time, if their, um, their uh, income status is... Um, causing a barrier for them and then adding some extra support or maybe seeing something else where, oh, those are the people who are taking the, the biggest advantage of those opportunities and how do we get the people who are in a slightly higher income bracket to, to do the same thing. Thank you. Uh, we were discussing a couple different questions that are related, three and ten in particular, about um, success as a student and what people's concerns were. So we're curious as to um, what differences between the first cohort and this next one you guys have found um, as far as people's biggest concerns are barriers um, and what the differences were, how that information surprised you, if, if it did at all. Um, and then I think the second question we all want to know is when you're performing stand-ups so we can come see you. <laughs> nope. <laughs> um, one of our questions was, what was the average number of hours uh, specific race students intend to work during the school year? 
um, and then I guess the other one could be uh, what percentage of students are concerned about their ability to finance their education uh, broken down by income range? Income range. Oh, I that too loud. So our questions were related to questions 7 and 11, and one of them was, are you volunteering anywhere outside of this program? And for 11, it was, if you're a first-generation student, what type of support do you receive from your parents, if any? Sure, great, thank you. So our question was related to one in five. Um, so if you're placed at a particular uh, research institution, and let's say, for example, you fall in love with a different um, discipline, and they don't have your major at, the, at your home institution, what would be, um, I guess, the career advice or um, yeah, advising that you would give that student you know, if he wants to transfer over to a different institution that offers that particular major? So. We had a, another question that was kind of similar to Rachel's one over there um, concerning questions 17, 18, and 19. They kind of asked about, you know, the staff and, like, how you are emotionally on your own campus. And I guess our question was, like, what kind of support we will get if somebody was harassed or they didn't feel like they were being supported. Like, um, like what Rachel was saying, we talked a lot about, you know, all that kind of stuff, but like, what is the actions that are gonna be taken in our own campuses? I mean, we're all the way in Hawaii, like how is that gonna work, and all the other stuffs. Yeah. Thank you. We have these four, right? Right? Wait, no, we just, we just did you go. Okay. Oh, I'm doing it? Yeah. Okay, well, so our first question is, which one is, ooh. <laughs> which one is it? Oh, uh, so for Running Start students at Clark, about the financial, how are we supposed to answer it if, um, if our parents pay for it? And what about the year afterwards, after Running Start? What if we're financially okay right now, but what about later? How would that work? And then for question 10, it says, how much do you need help? But in one of the later questions, and question, sorry guys, and question 20, it asks if you have any like ADHD, dyslexia, what if they do have dyslexia or ADHD, and they're not doing so well in their grades, but they say they don't need help, how would that go? One of the things, too, that's very hard to answer that question in particular is that when we collect these surveys for many some people that we also want to remain, have answers remain confidential. And uh, it, when someone does uh, disclose a disability about how, how you approach that. So it's really trying to make sure that we don't single out anyone, too. But and, and looking in broad strokes with that, too, that also shows something about that is a really curious answer, like the, the diet, uh, um, the dynamic that people have is that people who, are, who have a disability automatically need help, and that's not necessarily the case. In fact, sometimes they can be the ones who are helping others too, right? All right, two, two tables. You already went, one table. So we have two like, questions that could potentially be added to the survey. Um, how many times have our scholars like switched their major over the course of build um, following summer orientation, whether that be like directly related to summer orientation or just through um, the experiences that they've had through build? And then the other one is, um, have any scholars contacted uh, another scholar in, the, uh, in like the past month or you could change the time frame um, from another university? All right, thank you. Thank you, everyone. I got every table, right? We're good? Thanks for all those questions. Um, and also, more importantly, thank you for doing my job for me. Um, no, but I think I'm a, I'm a true believer in the answer is in with the room, or with, the answer is within the room. And that can also go for questions as well, that I'm just one angle looking at it. We just got 92 different angles on looking at how to look at this survey, 90, 91, 92. 92. Um, so thank you very much for doing that. I don't have the time today to do a full debrief as I love to do, um, but I do want to have you think about these as we're going through. Um, 
Debrief is just another word for reflection. Um, how did that brainstorm feel? How did it flow for you? Uh, how was it looking at that survey you just took from a different viewpoint? Um, if you learned anything, or if there's any factual statements you can pull from this last uh, 45 minutes about the limitations or the usefulness, um, or things you didn't understand before, aha moments, if you will, not the band. Uh, so so what, what actually do you remember after this? Uh, what sticks with you? Uh, are there any sparks? Is there anything you wish you would have learned that I didn't cover today? Um, and then kind of the now what? So is there a plan of action or thinking of more relevant questions? Uh, after this is done, will you be thinking about this uh, at the end of your weekend? Uh, will your experience with Exodo be a bit different if you're thinking about these survey questions and other questions that we ask you? Um, and then an actual question for you as before I end is, are you interested in receiving data like this? Are you interested in hearing about what we collect from scholars and from faculty and from institutions? Um, and then how? Uh, the best thing I have right now is the, uh, I don't know if they've talked about the Scholar newsletter that will be coming out. That's an opportunity for us to share kind of those, those big data questions that we have and, and create a dialogue in a sense because right now it can feel like it's just you answering a lot of our questions and uh, it, we don't put it in the back of a corner and we don't just forget about it. These are, these are things that I'm specifically here to look at and to uh, create that dialogue for us. Um, so, I think I just want to share that those responses do carry weight. They're needed and appreciated. Uh, I'm going to be in touch uh, with that dialogue. I also want to uh, thank you all for allowing me to talk. It's been an honor and a privilege to be able to be a part of this this week. And uh, as the anchor, uh, as you will, for this week, it's also been an honor to be the second most important person here. Um, <laughs> Uh, again, thanks for Don and Caitlin for allowing me to come out of my data cave or my fortress of solitude and uh, talk to you all um, and, and, and for helping me figure out how to do this. And then Adrian, too, for making sure that it's not just a picture, bunch of pictures of data visualizations, uh, which apparently is all I really want to talk about. Um, so thank you, uh, scholars, for also paying attention and listening to me today and uh, going through this activity with me. It's been really fun, and uh, I'll be around. So um, again, thank you very much.